The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. I'm going to introduce Paul. Um, I'm so excited that we finally got him here. Um, it's been a long time coming. We've been talking about this for a really long time. and. Um, we also saw each other at Burning Man last week, bumped into each other uh, plyendipitously <laughs> um, at a party and uh, just got to connect on a more personal level after um, having a lot more kind of logistical conversations. So Paul is the founder of The Third Wave, which is an educational platform around microdosing. Um, and he also runs um, a couple other projects that he's gonna talk more about. So I'm really excited to have him here and would you please give him a warm welcome. So I just, can you hear me okay? Is the, the really close, really close, okay, okay, so really close. So, wow, uh, I'm astounded by the turnout. So first and foremost, thank all of you uh, for showing up tonight and for being in the space with us to learn about what is a really important topic in this day and age, uh, psychedelic literacy, but even beyond that, the topic of microdosing and how that is playing a role in transforming uh, our culture alongside the current psychedelic renaissance. So if you could all just give yourselves a round of applause for being here, for, for being in this space, because I think because we do still live in this era of prohibition and because it is rooted in um, prejudice and it's rooted in misinformation and it's rooted in stigma and a lack of science, um, it takes courage to come to these spaces and to connect with other people who have also had authentic, transformative experiences, not only with microdosing, but also with higher doses of psychedelics. And um, that was my own personal experience when I dropped acid for the first time uh, at the age of 19. And that's more or less where this story gets interesting. Um, and I was joking about this last night when I did the same event in San Diego, but it seems that a lot of good things come from acid. When used responsibly, when used with purpose, when used with intention, uh, it's a, a wonderful tool. In fact, many people would say it's uh, the Western culture's psychedelic uh, because of its history tying back to ancient Greece, uh, where in ancient Greece, people like Plato used to drink a substance called kaikion, which was a beverage that was made from the ergot fungus, which is the same thing that LSD is synthesized from. So there's this tremendous connection with our, our roots as a Western culture with psychedelics. And in fact, in this day and age, it's very non-normative that these substances are prohibited. Uh, this is unlike any other time in human history that we've had such a suppression of these plant medicines. And um, in order to heal as a collective society, in order to, to transform ourselves from the inside out to be able to exist within the next hundred years, the earth will be fine, we might be fucked. <laughs> it's really important that we start to build more sustainable systems that are in line with human optimal well-being that are not just based in extractive capitalism and, and a, and a one-eyed focus on, on financial benefit, but instead comes at it from a much more holistic perspective of ecological and social well-being as well. And these tools, because of what they can do, play a tremendous role in that. And that's what inspired me to start the third wave. So basically, long story short, I started an online business. I lived abroad for a period of time. I had a little bit of extra time and I thought, why not start a website about psychedelics? 
It seemed like a good idea. There was a, a, a legalization of cannabis happening. There was more and more research coming out about psychedelics from institutions like NYU and Johns Hopkins, um, from nonprofits like MAPS, which has done phenomenal work in this space. Uh, Rick Doblin is a true hero uh, for what he's done over the past 30 years and really building the medical and institutional infrastructure to fully reintegrate psychedelics into not only our, our medical spectrum, but also cultural. And so uh, with this progress that was being made, there was still something missing. And from my perspective, uh, that was a digital media site that was focused on psychedelic literacy and education that was not presented in a mid-90s aesthetic. Uh, we love Arrowhead, but it's a little behind the times. Um, and so in order to present this education in a way that really resonated with people and it was more accessible to a mainstream population, we thought it was really important to be able to write accessible information that was rooted in scientific fact and lead with the topic of microdosing because it was an interesting touch point that was hitting all these facets of culture and society. And so one thing led to another. Um, we were fortunate enough to receive some mainstream press and publication. And before I know it, I found myself in New York City trying to actually build a legitimate organization. And what, where that has taken us, or where we are in the current here and now, is looking at how we can facilitate research on microdosing to prove some of these benefits that have been talked about anecdotally, uh, to look at how we can build in-person and online community around the topic of not only microdosing, but also psychedelics, and then to also look at how can we paint a new perception of psychedelics in a mainstream uh, view or eye. In other words, how do we maybe uh, evolve out of the aesthetic that was presented in the 60s and truly present psychedelics as tools and technologies that uh, not only people who are maybe more inclined to uh, uh, integrate those ethos from the 60s, but also people who are just uh, your ev average, everyday, um, you know, stay at home mom in suburbia. And because that's where I come from. I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Michigan, I'm from a small town. And so when I really think about how can we make these, these substances accessible to not only the, the coast, LA and New York, but also the Midwest, we really have to look at practical, uh, practical ways to do that. And because microdosing is so accessible, it's so non-ego threatening, because it's been, being utilized by people with depression, anxiety, by people who want to use it for creativity and peak performance, by biohackers, uh, by you know, people who are looking at it for neurogenerative restoration uh, as they get older. This is touching all spectrums, which is phenomenal. So I'm gonna take a second and pause because I'm starting to get excited. Um, <laughs> and then I go and go and go. So taking a step back, how many of you have microdosed before by a show of hands? Cool. How many of you have done a psychedelic before, by a show of hands? So most of you, maybe 70 to 80%. Now, what's interesting about microdosing is how it's acting as a gateway into these more transformative doses of psychedelics. And so before I go any further, I'll give a brief kind of primer on microdosing, the, the one to two minute primer. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about its applicability and then our future plans as a nonprofit and how we're going to integrate this to ideally build psychedelic literacy. So microdosing, what is microdosing? Well, I guess, yes. So what is microdosing? Who has a really great description or response of what microdosing is? Yes. My understanding, it's, uh, my understanding is about 10 to 15 micrograms, and I do it every three days. So 10 to 15 micrograms of LSD is what he's referring to, twice a week or every three days. So that's a really good starting point for microdosing. Who else maybe has something they want to share about what is microdosing? So a small percentage of whatever it is you're going to take, yes. A sub-perceptible dose. So a sub-perceptible dose of a psychedelic. What else is microdosing? Just kind of 
Yes. So it creates an architectural change. It creates ongoing neurogenesis or neuroplasticity. Yes. Okay, yeah, you macrodosed. You didn't microdose. Yeah. Get the benefits without all the, the snakes, the aliens, the vomiting, you know, these, these, these pretty, uh, pretty nice things. Good. So these are great descriptions. Anything else, anything else to add to that? Microdosing. Great. So it's a consumption of a susceptible dose, usually two times a week. This is Jim Fadiman's original protocol, who's the quote unquote godfather of microdosing. Um, and Jim basically started this in 2012, was on the Tim Ferriss podcast in 2015, and then uh, proceeded to kick all that off. And so it's consuming a low dose, usually a tenth of a regular dose, on a consistent schedule, usually twice a week, with a specific intention or purpose. So set and setting is still important with microdosing to facilitate some sort of benefit or outcome, whether that's a relief from depression, whether that's entering flow states, whether that's better coordination on the snowboard, uh, because people definitely are doing that. Um, won't recommend it necessarily, but there was a really good article published in the MAPS newsletter in 2011 about extreme sport athletes who were microdosing quite a bit in Colorado. And so people are using it for all different purposes. And um, what they notice at the end of the day is there seem to be very similar relationships or uh, developments with a protocol of microdosing um, as these higher doses of psychedelics. Now, caveat, major caveat, major caveat. We have a lot of extensive clinical research on high doses of psychedelics proving their efficacy without a uh, shadow of a doubt, you could say. Whereas with microdosing, much of the reports are still anecdotal. There have been, I believe, three or four studies now published that I'm aware of. There have been no clinical trials. However, from anecdotal reports that people are reporting, and from my own personal experience and the personal experience of many people that I've spoken to, there seem to be commonalities. And that's because what people are doing with microdosing, if we look at altered states on a, on a scale of continuum, right? So on the left, we have yoga and meditation, and we have maybe light breath work, float tanks. As we go a little bit farther along, we got your microdosing, maybe some more intense breath work. Maybe you're going out and doing a little survival course for three days in the wilderness. Some people do that. I've never tried it, don't think I will, but it sounds interesting. And then you go further into macro dosing and what I learned uh, in, in a very magical way this past week, things like Burning Man, which are more transformative festivals over a week long period where you're fully immersed in this basically altered state. And so if we look at that as a continuum, then each of those modalities can facilitate this sense of holistic well-being. And sometimes it's physical well-being by helping with inflammation in the body. Sometimes it's emotional well-being by helping with um, basically developmental trauma and, and recovering from neglect and some of these things that happen maybe in our childhood. And then it's also spiritual well-being of answering the question that many of us are, are wondering about is why the fuck are we here? And what's our purpose? What's our vision? You know, where is all this going? And I think this is what psychedelics help tremendously with. And that's why they're so effective as medicines in this day and age, because many of our clinical issues are directly tied to this sense of an existential angst, of not feeling connected, of not feeling like part of a community, of not feeling like there's a reason to live. And psychedelics can help with that process of healing and feeling safe and vulnerable and accepted and loved and all these really beautiful, beautiful sort of feelings and, and, and things. So this is where their transformative effect comes in and it looks like because of that, microdosing might be a great transition point. The clock is over there, thank you. So where are, we, where are we taking all of this? So recently, as I touched on earlier, we are now incorporating as a nonprofit at the third wave with the focus of increasing psychedelic literacy. And in doing that, we're not only starting the nonprofit at the third wave, but I'm gonna throw another um, little term. We're also trying to build a, what we're terming a psychedelic archipelago. 
Um, so imagine Hawaii on psychedelics. That's, that's, the, that's the vibe. And so with this idea of the third wave, with this collective sort of vision of how do we change the cultural conversation around psychedelics by doing three main things. Uh, research, so with the third wave, that's microdosing research, community development, in, uh, we could say online community. So we have, for example, a microdosing course uh, with a community. We have about a thousand people in that online. And then also starting uh, to do in-person events like this, collaborating with uh, societies like the AWARE Project, but also starting to do our own events in places like New York and San Francisco. And then further, the final thing is how do we utilize the popularity of microdosing and how do we utilize our messaging, which seems to be accessible to a wide demographic of people, as you'll notice looking around tonight, um, then how do we basically leverage that to be able to increase cultural psychedelic literacy? And so what I mean by psychedelic literacy is that when we do transition, hopefully, fingers crossed, when we do transition from a medicalized psychedelic world into ideally being able to fully integrate these substances into our cultural framework, this is what we call open access. And open access will require a major push to educate a large populace about the benefits of psychedelics, about the risks of psychedelics, about the contraindications for psychedelics, about things like set and setting, uh, about things like, you know, what's the difference between LSD and psilocybin and MDMA? Uh, these are all really important topics that I would say most, if not all, like basically most people don't have, which is a shame. It's an absolute shame because these tools, when understood properly, are tools of transformation. So that, I, I wanted to paint a little picture for you of where microdosing is, how it developed, how that led to the third wave, this larger vision that we have of psychedelic literacy, and not only doing that through the digital media nonprofit, but I also co-founded a retreat center in Amsterdam called Synthesis, uh, and my co-founder will come up and join us in a little bit, as well as two other guests for a brief panel, uh, where we now facilitate hands-on retreats for people with psilocybin truffles, which are legal in Amsterdam. And so we can finally, within the first Western framework, start to look at how we can work hands-on with these substances, not in microdoses, but in higher transformative doses, as, as, as most people are now terming macrodoses. Um, or as one of my mentors once said, you know, we really didn't call macrodoses macrodoses until there was microdosing. So you can just call them, you know, doses. You don't need to, you don't need to clarify. So with all that being said, um, I'm going to introduce three people uh, who will come up and join us for a panel. Uh, the first one, let's see if I can find him. Matt, where's Matt? Great, so the first one is Matt Cooper. I met Matt Cooper about a year ago, interviewed him for my podcast. We've been working together on a project, uh, a coaching project to help facilitate optimal well-being with microdosing. And Matt's going to speak about the intersection of microdosing and physical well-being, as well as some of these other, other elements of emotional and spiritual well-being. So if you could give him a round of applause, please, for joining us, that would be super. Thank you. So our second panelist tonight is uh, my dear, dear friend and someone I've known for about a, a year and a half now. We met uh, in Amsterdam. Actually, the first time I, I collaborated on doing these microdosing events was with Martine, or as I affectionately call him, Marty. Um, and so with Marty, uh, we were able to basically facilitate a first workshop about microdosing and everyone at that workshop also got to take a microdose, which is pretty cool uh, because truffles are legal in the Netherlands. And ever since that point in time, uh, Martijn and I have grown closer. We built the Third Waves microdosing course together and then Martijn also co-founded Synthesis with me. So uh, if you could please give Martijn a warm welcome to you. And our third guest tonight really needs no introduction because all of you know her. It is Ashley Booth, the founder of The Aware Project. And if so, if you could also give her a warm round of applause. I'll stand. 
Ashley and I met at Psychedelic Science last year in person for the first time, very briefly, I think right after you helped with Jim Fadiman's um, kind of introdu introducing him and that whole thing. A and then, as she mentioned, we've been having phone calls the past year, year and a half, and then finally uh, got a chance to connect at uh, the burn and then again here in LA. So thank you for hosting this space. Thank you for putting on this event. Thank you for all the work that you've done. And I'm really excited to dig further into it. Uh, about the community element, uh, because that's also one of these pillars that will be really important in building cultural psychedelic literacy is facilitating uh, communities that are engaged in this work so that not only can we just come around and talk about drugs for you know an hour, hour and a half, but that this can actually turn into something productive that leads to a change in, for example, local policy, that leads to a change in how, for example, medical institutions might perceive this, and so that's all really important. So, um, Martin, I'd love to start with you because uh, you're furthest away from me. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience microdosing with plant medicines. Uh, things like maybe Ibogaine, mescaline, psilocybin as well. Uh, I would love to hear. And then it'd be also great if you could illuminate a little bit about uh, what, what we're doing with synthesis and, and the differences that you've seen between microdoses and and macro doses uh, with people that we've worked with. So I'd love to hear that from you. Hey everyone, um, my name is Martijn and I am from the Netherlands. I'm Dutch. Um, closer. Can everybody hear me? Everybody in the back as well. Stand up. All right. Hey everyone, my name is Martijn. I'm Dutch. I'm from the Netherlands. There's a little bit of an accent in my voice. Um, thank you, Paul, for the wonderful introduction. I love you. Um, we just spent an amazing burn together, and I'm still a little bit in two worlds. Um, <sighs> thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my experience with plant medicine. So I first started microdosing, I think it was around 2013, when a Iboga shaman told me I should take a spoonful of iboga bark three days in a row and then four days off, three months before my iboga journey. And it was quite an interesting experience because I was, as, does anybody know iboga here, iboga bark? So, so 10, 10, 20 percent. So that's, it's a root that's from Gabon, uh, um, Africa. It has, a, it, it has a, a tryptamine ibogaine in it. It's a very, very complex um, psychedelic that does a lot of things to the brain. And it stays in your blood for around 30 to 40 hours. So if you take it one day and you take it another day, and the third day it starts to stack up. And by the third day, you're like constantly in this in-between state. And I really liked it. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, my dreams became more interesting. My insights became um, more refined. And what Iboga does, it kind of downplays part of the brain that's um, connected with craving. So I didn't feel as much craving to check my emails, to um, eat the, my junk food or whatever. And I felt it really helped with my meditation practice. It made me really present. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I can just do psychedelics and not have to um, really optimize set and setting to take a day off. I could just continue working. I could um, do whatever I wanted to do, but also have that psychedelic awareness. Um, about half a year later, I came across James Fadiman's book, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. I was like, oh, this is interesting. There's actually people doing this in different set and settings. And so I started microdosing. So um, you did it You did it before it was cool. Is that I did it before it was cool. That, that's what you're saying, okay. Yeah, I, so wanted, I wrote my first to, article uh, on, yeah, on it yeah. in 2014. Yeah, in fact, when, I, when we published our first microdosing infographic, I, um, when I published this first microdosing infographic, I pretty much, I, I, we could say, borrowed a lot of the, uh, the information from this original article that Martin had published, which was fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I borrowed it from a lot of other places too. So uh, it's co-creation. Co-creation. Right, co-creation. It's, it's continuing this conversation about the integration of psychedelics, and um, then I started microdosing mushrooms, and I felt that my emotional awareness improved. That I it would be easier to stay present with things that I didn't like. Uh, with social feedback, for example, when people would turn their heads away, I would be more perceptive and more in tune with that. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I started to journal. And on the days I was microdosing, I had a better time. I had more growth. I had more insights. And so I started writing this article about it, um, which really took off until the third wave came <laughs> online and they kind of stole all my traffic. Um, <laughs> yeah, that happened. That totally uh, um, <laughs> and and to, to continue that, like, how did that lead then to, uh, you know, our relationship and then what has been developing with microdosing right. and transitioning into synthesis with these higher doses? So we met at this panel in Amsterdam where everybody was microdosing, which was really cool to do. Um, and we started to hang out and talk about like, hey, this is pretty cool, but can we actually offer people a psychedelic experience? And luckily enough, I'm Dutch, and there's this little loophole in the law that says that the truffles don't fall under the opium law, but under the food law. So normal shops can just sell it and we can actually offer this as a treat to eat and guide people through these experiences. And the big difference, I think, what you just asked between the micro and the macro is the amount of transformation. It's the intensity of it. And with a micro, you can kind of direct things, like strong intention, um, strong, uh, intense experiences are not likely on a microdose, unless you combine it with strong yoga practice or breath work. Um, but on a mi macrodose, it's quite common to have at these moments that you're completely overwhelmed, that things come up that are very challenging. And it's often recommended, especially if you don't have any experience, to have guidance with that. And so people will come up to us on um, events where we talked about microdosing, like, hey, where can I do this? Like, how do I access this? And that's one of the big problems right now um, with it being banned, that people don't have access, that, that the barriers to actually having these experiences are so high. And so we started to offer these retreats that have been amazing, because we've seen amazing transformations of one or two doses of pe um, per person, of high do dose of psilocybin. And people that maybe drink too much, don't tell the truth to their spouse, they, they are stuck um, with these habits or thought patterns of depression, anxiety. Um, like everybody has some of this, but they come out of it and they feel refreshed, they feel reset, they feel reborn. And that has been the effect psychedelics have been on me when I've been stuck or I've been dealing with a problem. And that's what we've been seeing as well with other people. Um, was there Great. Yeah, and I think one thing to add to, to Martin's description for synthesis is this, this ties into this larger narrative or this, this larger um, growth of psychedelic literacy is how do you make these experiences accessible for people not only in microdoses but higher doses. Uh, whereas, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard of ayahuasca. Um, and ayahuasca retreats, and you can go to Peru and Brazil and some of these elements, and we noticed that the shamanistic approach to psychedelics, while rooted in indigenous traditions, is still quite too esoteric for a more mainstream population. So we asked, how could we build a retreat that is more based in Western principles and values while still utilizing some of that historical knowledge that we have of set and setting and, and, and ceremony. Um, and this has been the big thing that we've been in development with and, and asking about how we can create that for synthesis. And to add to that, this is 
what I believe, one of the very few places in the world right now where there's medical supervised, we have, we train, we have trained facilitators, and we do modern research to actually see, like, hey, we have all this clinical data, and how does that match us with actually going on a retreat with a group of people, and not necessarily with trained therapists, but actually having that experience, like how do people come out? And the preliminary data shows well-being goes up, anxiety goes down, depression goes down, um, nature connectedness goes up, um, people have mystical experiences, deeply meaningful realizations about themselves, their families, what they want to do in life, and it seems to work. And for those who raised their hand that had a deep um, psychedelic experience, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we really load them up. We really, really load them up. <laughs> we really load so, them up, yeah. So we have, a, we have a nice, like, so basically, Martin and I don't, neither of us have medical backgrounds. I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur and I hold space um, at these retreats. Uh, but because we don't have that medical background, we make sure to screen out any participants who come with clinical conditions. And we mostly work with people who are interested in elevated states of being. Um, and, and, and then the last thing I'd love to hear you just two or three minutes about, like, what's the vision for synthesis? Where is this going? How is this developing? I'd love to hear you talk about that. So the vision we have is we want to legalize this. We want to create a institute or a place to go in every big city, uh, starting in Amsterdam, starting um, all of the Netherlands because the legal climate is more favorable, but then exporting that all over uh, Europe so people have actually have an option to go and feel safe and be guided properly um, to have these experiences that are so deeply valuable to us as human beings. Um, and more research, more combination with other uh, modalities like coaching, like spiritual practices, maybe VR. Um, there's uh, so much potential that I think we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with psychedelic experiences. I've seen some shit at Burning Man, and so <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of inspiration to actually build something that people can come in reliably and know the quality they can expect. Because um, we have modern hospitals everywhere and those practices are standardized. We don't have that with psychedelics yet. And that's that's an issue because a lot of people could benefit from it. Um, so the vision is to make sure it's available and accessible to everyone who needs it. Great, thank you. <laughs> and Coop, I'd love to hear from you about, first off, this intersection between microdosing and well-being. Uh, starting maybe with physical well-being and then some of these other, you know, emotional and spiritual. And then I think we'd also love to hear about, um, within that, what's your background? What's your experience with microdosing? And then how does this play out with the, the client work that you do um, when, when coaching people with these substances? You guys want me to stand up? All right. Appreciate you guys being here. Let's fix my shirt. Psychedelics don't, don't fix everything, including goofiness. Um, so yeah, I would say that our work, my name is Matt Cooper, our work mainly is focused on using psychedelics and uh, literature and research on the biological tie-in of the brain and the nervous system to help reprogram the mind-body interface, right? And so sometimes that can mean something simple like how to do some neurophysiologic tuning with the nervous system to actually better uh, sort of co-enable your psychedelic experience, whether that's microdosing uh, or macrodosing. Uh, in addition to that, sometimes we actually will use psychedelics as a part of a holistic perspective, a panoramic view, if you will, uh, in a biopsychosocial model uh, for health, uh, personal well-being, uh, fitness, uh, and peak performance, uh, and, and sometimes also for restoring health as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I actually believe psychedelics, including a, kind of a biological pie, if you will, actually have a position for using our knowledge of the nervous system to actually unpack emotional trauma and to be able to not have our nervous system limit us uh, and our potential in life. And I think that segues nicely into where I come from. Um, and I, if I grew up today, uh, a little bit about me, I probably would have been somewhere on the OCD, ADHD, autism spectrum. 
I kind of just never really fit in. And I didn't realize at the time how much my own nervous system, um, emotional trauma that I had in, uh, basically endured when I was younger actually was, was really sort of tattooing me and having kind of a hold on not just my health in and of itself and making me kind of more or less sick all the time, but also in, in really who I was and when I would try to sort of reach outside of myself to um, play on a higher field, if you will, I would find that I would just sort of like light up in kind of a neuromuscular way. And I, quite by accident, I actually discovered psychedelics. And so my own personal transformation then inspires sort of a, 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 a want to pay it forward, if you will. And so I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit if you so probably confuse people. One, I, I think before you get into that, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your background. So what is it, you know, how did you come to psychedelic professionally? You know, what is that background? What do you do um, in terms of your work? Right, so in conjunction with the third wave, Paul, um, our friend Derek, and then in my own private practice, uh, I actually for a long time was focused on helping people with uh, a holistic health, nutrition, performance sort of uh, model, and then kind of a collection of health issues, the, the aforementioned issues sort of befell me, and then I discovered a, a lot of tools, not just psychedelics, uh, to be fair, for personal development and uh, personal transformation. You know, if they say we change out of inspiration or desperation, I was, I was definitely the latter at that point. And so that really cracked me wide open, since I, I don't come from a family that's really open to these kind of things. And at that point, uh, I, I, you know, it, it sort of led to the, the psychedelics one way or another. And then in my own practice, I'll help people basically, like starting with the most important thing, and that's unpacking the biological effect of trauma. I'll actually help people use psychedelics and then other therapies to to really move past these kind of things. And the way it works in effect, and Stanislav Grof even talked about this, he called them coex systems, if you wanna look that up. Uh, but in a nutshell, when something traumatic happens to us, and it doesn't have to be a capital T trauma, like a, you know, a rape or a molestation or something like that, it can be something as simple as a car accident, it can be a birth trauma, uh, it could be getting picked last in the playground or a number of other things, uh, it, it actually gets stored in a way in our nervous system because we don't have the emotional equipment or maturity uh, upstairs to really deal with it at that point. And then when that happens, it kind of permanently tattoos your nervous system. And from there, you're left in this state of sort of either low level fight or flight perpetually, think PTSD. And potentially, uh, you're also sort of left with, um, you're almost left with this nervous system that's activated in a low level fight or flight perpetually, and it can be triggered by a number of different things, usually related back to your trauma. And, and it's not always linear. And so when that happens, what you'll find is that when your nervous system is lit up like that, time and time and time again in that fight or flight state, it's really depleting at the cellular level. Have you guys heard of mitochondria before? So it's like the little cellular energy batteries that power everything that we do. And so when you, when you get depleted at that level from the trauma, you're, again, your nervous system can get activated in a way that it thinks a 300 pound tiger is chasing you. It doesn't necessarily know that you're just stressed about work emails or that you really need to have that conversation and unpack that truth with your significant other, but just can't. And so what I'll do from there is uh, identify what aspect of health that it's actually like creating issues in downstream. Sometimes it's a lack of neurotransmitters. Sometimes it's shooting your hormones in the wrong direction. And then I'll work with people to repair that on a, uh, a nutritional level and, and you know, other interconnected means, sleep, so on and so forth. And then I'll actually use uh, somatic experiencing exercises. Do people know what that is here? Yeah, raise your hand, please. So in, there's a number of them, but in a way, it's a way to discharge at a neurological level these, um, these neural ghosts in the machine that aren't really there anymore. And so when you do that and you combine it with something like psychedelics and also to be fair, breath work meditation, you can actually reprogram that mind body interface. Now, sometimes that just means getting yourself healthier, but other times it can mean when you go in for that big job interview or when you quit your job and want to uh, become an entrepreneur and start the third wave, or maybe when you want to be better at talking to the opposite sex. When you try to reach out of yourself, your nervous system will sabotage you in, in the same way that that trauma or trauma has affected you. Um, in my case, you know, I had sexual shaming at one point as well, and so I would get lit up in a certain kind of way in uh, intimate settings. And so through actually, through this work, you know, a constellative effect, 
I was able to undo these sort of tattoos on my nervous system. And then now when I get encountered in, uh, with a situation where I'm sort of leveling up in life in a very positive way or a familiar situation, instead of having my nervous system cause all these triggers that make me not show up to do whatever I want to do as myself, um, I can kind of like, you know, you can kind of bypass in some ways, bypass things like stress, anxiety, and you can kind of let the somatic version of your nervous system, that like five-year-old kid we all have inside, catch up to that upstairs intellectual version. And so our work is really centered around, uh, this branch of your work and my work is really centered around helping people move past these things that limit us in life. And in addition to that too, creating a biopsychosocial model for health that truly creates a holistic perspective, not just in the Eastern sense, but while still respecting that, but also creates a, a bit more of a Western uh, mechanistic understanding of it as well. So can you explain what a biopsychosocial um, what that is, just a little bit. We could call it BPS for short. You know, BPS, all right. BPS. So yeah. it's, it basically acknowledges the fact that we're not our health and our quality of life. You know, everything is related in a way. And so we're not just, when we want to focus on personal transformation or health transformations, we need to focus on the social tribal aspect. We need to focus on the interpersonal aspect and what limiters in our own hero's journey we're going through both personally and the biological consequence from that and how emotions and physiology is really uh, truly a feedback loop, if you will. And, and again, there are some people who come to us simply wanting to tune their nervous system to be hyper-receptive to uh, their, their mystic experience or their microdosing and, and also finding out what's best for them because we do know that Microdosing sometimes causes anxiety in people, and so sometimes that can mean you have an imbalance of brain chemicals, neurotransmitters, so you might consider trying a different one, if that makes sense. Great, and if you could maybe just for two or three minutes talk about then what are some of the modalities that can be used when it comes to physical well-being and microdosing, uh, and emotional well-being and microdosing. So in other words, how do those intersect and overlap to facilitate elevated states, to facilitate healing, or whatever else it might be? Okay, so like a little more of like pragmatic advice now. Yeah, so for example, like what I've done before and, and in my work, I'll like work with someone to optimize like their fat ratio, like omega-3 to 6. Everybody's heard of omega-3, fish oil, things like that. So for example, doing that will actually help program your psychedelic experience a lot better, especially if you're somebody who's really, really, really hyper intolerant. Um, in terms of personal healing, Using psychedelics in conjunction with certain things like GABA, for example, can actually help really uh, truly relax the nervous system uh, and allow some of these changes to take shape. Uh, and this is on a personal level now, uh, not necessarily just tactical fitness or, or medical, if you will. And I think that, that element, that, that personalized medicine element is a really, really interesting aspect of how we can customize then psychedelic protocols in combination with other modalities like breath work and meditation and yoga, like things maybe like EMDR or just obviously with, with what they're doing with, with talk therapy as well with, with the, the MAPS trials and MDMA. There are various overlaps between these different modalities that facilitate holistic well-being. And I think a huge potential in the next 10 years is to look at, okay, if we're doing MDMA therapy, for example, like MAPS system, which Ashley will speak about in a minute, in phase two trials, I believe 69 or 70% of people were cured from PTSD, and on average, they had treatment-resistant PTSD for 17.8 years. And 70% of those people were cured in the phase two trial, um, which is why MAPS has now received breakthrough therapy status. But what if we could even increase that number further? What if we can customize psychedelic protocols so that what you give to a person who's 100 pounds and comes from maybe a background of sexual assault trauma and that's going to be much different from someone who is, for example, uh, 230 pounds and comes from a background of maybe war trauma. And so even these small differences could facilitate then different modalities to be fully useful. And we can start to use things like big data to be able to track and measure that efficacy. And, and then I could throw in like, and we can also use blockchain and you know, we could, uh, there, there are a few more buzzwords, but I'll, I'll just minimize those. Uh, as much as possible. So the personalized medicine element is really interesting. Anything final to add about uh, psychedelics and, and well-being? I really just think that it comes down to taking a truly panoramic approach, whether you're trying to change something that's a little bit more physiological in nature or whether it's trying to change something a little bit more interpersonal as well. And so I think that if you 
think in terms of the fact that everything is related, you're more likely to come up with a solution and a solution that sticks at that rather than a quick fix. Uh, I also think adding in a layer of personalization is, is absolutely necessary and, and that's why uh, Paul and I along with our friend Derek actually chose to start up the coaching component of the third wave. Right. Thank you guys. Thank you. And Ashley, we'd love to hear from you about your work with the AWARE project. As I, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's my strong belief, and I think also your strong belief, that to go from a, a medical, strictly medical model, which we appear to be entering, uh, to something that's more integrated culturally, community is a really important element of that. Um, so you know, we'd love to hear from you about what inspired you to start the AWARE project, um, what have been some of the challenges along the way, but also maybe some of the beautiful moments, and, 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 and where do you see not only the AWARE project developing, but just with your panorama of you know, your work with, with MAPS, how might community involvement facilitate you know, eventual adoption of psychedelics? So. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll start a little bit about with my background. Um, I worked as a marine biologist and oceanographer for nine years. Um, until I had a very profound experience with FedMeO DMT that uh, completely shifted my whole perspective and really activated me. Um, and, and to use the words that you said before, I, this kind of sense of wanting to pass it forward. And so three and a half years ago, uh, felt called to find where are all the other people that are doing psychedelics and, and, and doing research and all sorts of things. and. I was seeing that there was a lot going on in San Francisco. Um, there's psychedelic societies, bicycle day events, all sorts of things. Uh, and looking down here in Los Angeles, and there was just no nothing happening. And it's like, this is a huge, huge city with a very diverse population. Uh, and why is there no group of people doing this? So uh, we started off by doing a bicycle day event in celebration of the discovery of LSD by Dr. Albert Hoffman, and sort of in kind of leading up to that event to try and get a little bit more um, excitement going for the Bicycle Day event, we started doing these salon events. And our first speaker was uh, Kathleen Wirt, and she used to hold these um, Friday night dinners once a month at her house for 10 years where the local psychedelic community would gather in uh, secrecy and have little chats um, and she would do this in Venice out of her house, and this was in the late 90s to early 2000s. Um, and so it was really great to have her come and be our first speaker to hear about this uh, era um, and, and how different it was in the culture of, you know, because they, they were very, you know, anyone who smoked pot outside the house was like banned from the, the event because it was really, really, you know, they were, everyone was very, uh, much more paranoid because of the culture. So it's just interesting to see how things have um, opened up a lot more now to be able to create events and, and for people to feel safe enough to share their stories and being able to, you know, online have platforms to be able to do so as well. So I highly recommend checking that out. All of our talks are on YouTube. Um, so started these events and then have been doing them for three and a half years now. Uh, through that process, I uh, was feeling more and more uh, just my heart wasn't in the oceanography work that I was doing anymore. I, I still feel very strongly about the oceans and the animals, but I had this insight, I suppose, that was if we're not going to save the animals and the planets and the oceans until we heal people. And so I, I'm definitely a systems-based person and an, an efficiency-minded person, and so I always like to go to the root of the issue. And so if we can use psychedelics to help us go to the root of our problems as an, as an individual um, portal, um, and then also to create a s um, collective healing together as we all support each other. And so kind of jumping in, well, I guess I'll finish my bio. Uh, so as I was leaving my job uh, with uh, doing oceanography. I started working as a psycho-spiritual retreat leader at Crossroads Treatment Center in Tijuana, uh, using, supporting people as they went through 
I began experiences and the 5-MeO DMT experience. Both of those are unscheduled in Mexico. And then uh, Crossroads closed about a year ago. Uh, and just at that time, I got hired by MAPS, and I'm now the study coordinator for the MAPS clinical trial of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of PTSD here in Los Angeles. So um, that's kind of, um, so now I'll be able to combine both of my favorite things, which is research and psychedelics. So, um, and I'm also in grad school right now um, to become a therapist and will be very shortly, probably in the next year, be able to be one of the therapists um, participating in the clinical trial. So it's been quite the journey. <laughs> Uh, and I feel very blessed to be here and very, uh, the more and more that I say yes to this path, the more and more flow I see in my life. Um, and so there's got to be something here, <laughs> you know, um, to be able to see um, the support that I've gotten from the people around me, but then also uh, just the flow of life coming through and being able to, to bestow so many beautiful gifts. Great, and can you, I'd, I'd love to hear more about the phase three trials. I think for that sure. would be a really great thing to, to, to just for our audience to know a little bit more about. For sure. Yeah, yeah so MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, is a nonprofit organization, a very unique situation where they're a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. So they've been re uh, gathering private funds for over 30 years to legalize uh, certain types of psychedelic medicines. Right now, we're really focusing on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of PTSD. It's the one that's the furthest along right now. So the, the clinical trial process, so for anything to become a medicine, it has to go through these clinical phases from zero to four. Uh, so right now, it took you know, several decades to get through the phase one, phase two phases. Um, and just like Paul was mentioning earlier in those phase two trials, um, we were seeing that between 60 to 80% of people with chronic treatment-resistant depression no longer ha were diagnosable with PTSD after three treatments with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Really amazing. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. we, don't, we don't like to say cured, <laughs> but it's sustained remission. Um, but uh, we do do uh, longer-term follow-ups with people, and we have... Um, We've had a couple people that have gone through those trials that come to previous AWARE Project events, so I think, believe one of them is here tonight. Um, and so you can also go in onto our YouTube channel to check those out, it's really interesting. So the phase that we're moving into now, so we finished phase two, and we are just moving into phase three. Like literally in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be starting phase three, uh, which means that this is the last phase of the process. It's broken up into two trials, MAP1 and MAP2. Um, each trial will have about 100 people, and those people are going to be spread across uh, 14 different sites um, over the, across the, in the U.S., Canada, and Israel. And the idea is to take the protocol that was developed in phase two and bring it out to all these other different sites with new therapists, new locations, and see does the protocol still work. So this is a testing, and what's really fascinating is that the FDA was so surprised that we were only doing 200 people because most clinical trial uh, studies take thousands of people because they're trying to see a very small effect size. But because our effect size is so big, you know, <laughs> for having people that had chronic treatment PTSD to not being diagnosable anymore, uh, you don't really need that many people to be able to show its, sti sig uh, its statistical significance. So. Um, we are going to be applying for breakthrough status. We don't have it quite yet, um, but we will be collecting the data at an interim por portion of the trial to be able to see if the numbers are essentially looking like they did in phase two. Um, and if they are, then we'll go move into uh, an open access, which means that ethically, if we have a treatment that is better than any other treatment on the market for a particular diagnosis, it is ethically unsound for us to hold it back while we wait for the rest of the bureaucratic process to 
fall in, to, to finish the process towards making it into a medicine. So if things look as good as phase two, which I don't see why there should be any reason that they should not, um, in the next year, year and a half, we will be able to legally give the public MDMA psychotherapy. So really, really good. <laughs> Yeah, it's very, very exciting. Um, and what's going to be really interesting about this point is that once MDMA gets rescheduled from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, all that research, so when you're in a Schedule 1 category, it's very hard to get research money. You can't get research money from the government. As soon as it's Schedule 3, you can apply for federal grants, and so the research is going to be able to blossom because all this new money that doesn't have to be... Uh, painfully raised by MAPS or other organizations to be able to do the research. So at that point, we'll be able to see, okay, well, what else is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy good for? Could it be used in group therapy? Could it be used with other types of modalities? Could it be used for couples therapy? Could it be used for, um, I think there's uh, treating social anxiety, all sorts of things. So that's when we're gonna really gonna see this research blossom and this is gonna be a way for the public to be able to start to warm up to the idea of the transformational effects of non-ordinary states of consciousness. So it's very exciting. And they also gave MDMA to an octopus. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know, I was like, why am I not part of that study? It's, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, imagine how the Venn cool diagrams be. fitting together finally in my career. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used, to, I used to study uh, squid, so <laughs> that, was, that was my thing. Um, apparently, the octopus has got uh, more social. Pro which social, is, which is interesting. That, I'm yeah. Right, right. Eight harms for hugging. <laughs> <laughs> They're normally pretty reclusive characters, so yeah, so having them hang out a little bit more, that was really fun. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you so much for your work. Oh, do you want me to talk about and we'll, we'll probably get into questions and, and then we'll get into that. Yeah, so if you could all give Ashley a big round of applause for all of her work. And we'll see you again. So what I'd love to do now is, is move into questions. So we'll do Q&A for anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes. We have until 10 o'clock to be here. Um, so we'll probably do questions till 9.30. Um, and... And basically, do we have someone who can volunteer with maybe passing around the mic? Yeah, could you do that, Lana? And then we'll just share that mic. Okay, question number one. I saw you in the glasses back there first, so please. Hi guys, thank you very much for sharing this. It's a brave thing to do. Um, Matt, my question is for you. Um, I want to, I was really touched by what you were saying and it resonates a lot with something that I'm working on. And I thought, you know, if, if, if everyone seems, if it seems valuable, whatever, I, could, I could share a little something of what I'm hearing from you and I want to know if it's the same thing. Um, the way I sort of frame it in my mind is that um, I've done a lot of work on like psychological things that have happened and I feel like the beliefs that fed a lot of that unhealthy psychology as a result of a lot of the things growing up and all of that are sort of healed. I don't believe certain things about myself anymore, but I find myself still being triggered, it feels like neurologically, to behave as if I still believe those things. Uh, is, is, that, is that what you're talking about and is what you do the sort of f facing that specifically? Yeah, so, so when I say essentially reprogramming the mind-body interface, there we go. Uh, so when I say that, that, that's exactly what I mean. There, there is a biological tie-in for this too. Uh, but that being said, someone mentioned talk therapy as well. Is that? Oh, hypno, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, that being said, there is a broad brushstroke here. There is an immense toolkit from which to work from. And there are, it's not just psychedelics, right? There are some foods we might want to talk about, you know, unpacking too, that are actually excitotoxins, can actually kind of fry your nervous system and cause you to be over aggro as well. Um, so there are, but, but that being said, there might be some hidden gifts in what you're going through right now too, right? Like for me, I was always this 
bound up like ball of energy, this fast twitch athlete on the basketball court, which helped a ton. Um, and I always really got stuff done, but I had a lot of difficulties relaxing too. So the idea is to strike a balance and uh, there's actually tie-ins for, for addiction here as well. And then again, the uh, hypnotherapy is a big time, a huge tool in the toolkit too, because sometimes what you might need to do without recommending anything specifically because, don't try this at home, um, a lot of positive work gets done through not running from this, but actually going through and, and reliving it, kind of reactivating those same things, but with new neurological feelings, potentially good ones from MDMA or, or a number of other options as well. Um, and again, yeah, some, sometimes the tools are medical, sometimes they're uh, techno-biological, kind of uh, almost like a techno-shaman, if you will. Sometimes they're gonna be nutritional and holistic as well, but uh, that, I hope that sort of elucidates a little bit without getting too far in the weeds. It's, it's, there is a biological tie in and it's probably neurological as well. Hi, can you hear me? It has to be very close, doesn't it? Okay. Thanks to um, all of you for your work and for being here. It's such an exciting, I think, category to help reveal all the um, talents of the human brain. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the, I think, the layers of trauma, not only from maybe emotional traumas in childhood and, and whatnot, but also physical trauma. And um, in terms of TBIs, brain injuries from soccer, falling off a horse, mountain bike, car crash, whatever. Um, there's so many people in the population that have, you know, brain injuries, anything from minor to major. I've had several. And I'm curious um, if there's uh, any studies being done about rebuilding, you know, physical pathways when there's, um, we all know brains are incredibly, you know, uh, able to recover with the plasticity, but rebuilding from concussions and head trauma. And then also uh, my second question, maybe not related, how do you figure out which plant medicine to use um, from the three different categories, I guess, for any given treatment modality? Yeah, Coop, I guess, or whoever's. I'll start with the, the first question. So what I'm hearing, and then I'd love for you to take the, what do you want to, do you want to take the, the first question? Okay. Uh, so the difference between like LSD, psilocybin, and maybe ayahuasca, I think those are three good. And, and maybe with ayahuasca, something like microdosing, iboga, or ibogaine. LSD, a lot of people who are microdosing LSD seem to be doing more so for cognitive development, for creativity, for brainstorming. I think that's why we saw a lot of, that's one of the reasons why we saw a lot of interest in Silicon Valley uh, with the whole birth thing of this microdosing. Steve Jobs is also, I think, uh, largely responsible for that because of his biography that came out in 2011 saying LSD was amazing. Um, so I think that played a big role. And, and I think that's because LSD is slightly, slightly more dopaminergenic than the others. So it has that ability to help stimulate uh, the, the cognitive creativity and development. Whereas mushrooms, at least what I've noticed, and I think I heard this in, in what Martine said as well, is they seem to be more oriented towards, towards feeling and emotional development and resonance. And um, however, there's also obviously clear impacts on the brain because uh, psilocybin and LSD in particular activate something called the 5-HT2A receptor, which has been tied to neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Um, ayahuasca, in terms of microdosing it, I don't have anything so much to say about that. Um, Martine, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Okay, Martine hasn't done it apparently. So. But uh, I know Martine has spent a lot of time in the rainforest with Amazonian shamans about microdosing ayahuasca. Um, so I spent some time with the sequoia in the Amazon in Ecuador, and they're actually against microdosing. We talked about that. Um, they say it creates sorcerers, and my modern interpretation of that is that um, you get the insights, but not the whack in the face. It's not necessarily a humbling experience. And so you feel like you've gained something, but it hasn't really fully sinked in on all levels of your being. And so it might create some incongruency where you maybe change your belief system, but your body is still acting the old way. And so 
they are actually against it, which I found very interesting to find out. I think there's also an element of spiritual bypassing that comes with that too, in which you can be logically, as, as you put, actually okay with things upstairs. And so things like that, where you actually do get whacked and you know, do a, take a mystic dose, if you will, can maybe have a little bit more of a profound impact on that too. Um, with respect to changing neuromotor pathways for the purpose of self-development as well, what I would also say is it's important to know that certain areas of the brain, like the amygdala and the xiphoid nucleus, there's some phenomenal work being done at the Huberman Lab in Stanford that shows that these parts of the brain actually light up during states of fear, right, and, or, and or high arousal. And so what's interesting is that what we do know is that psychedelics have a role in the melting down of the default mode network, this sort of segregation, segregational aspects of the brain that actually are responsible for us not having that inner dialogue with ourselves as easily and or sort of freezing up and protecting ourselves. And what's really interesting to me is that you can have an experience where those fear factor parts of your brains get lit up and the worst part of it, after that your forebrain, which is responsible for projecting meaning onto experience, gets lit up as well. What does that mean? It means that if something bad happens to you that's traumatic, you will forever have that imprinted as, oh, I am a loser, or this or that. And it could be positive too. And so when you encounter that same situation in the future, that same neural combination lights up because that's how you survived last time, and it's trying to protect you, and really it's hindering your performance because the brain works on a protect to perform continuum in effect. And so a lot of the promising effects on a biological level from psychedelics come from really undoing that so you can truly start self-authoring your own story and or architect your health better. And in terms of research studies, I don't know of any that are undergoing at the moment about this relationship between psychedelics or, and concussion or uh, recovering from traumatic brain injury. I know uh, I did the same event in Portland about a year and a half ago. We had a woman who was microdosing uh, after a traumatic brain injury, a car crash. It was really <sighs> helpful within that process. We also had a team member on the third wave who got into a really bad car crash uh, who's been microdosing, and it's really helped with that recovery as well. But I don't think there's any clinical research currently being done on that. Other questions? Right here. Hi. Um, so I saw the DMT molecule um, you know, a documentary on Netflix, and it talked about how people naturally have some DMT in their brain. And when I was a baby, I would do this thing where I'd rub my eyes, and I had these psychedelic experiences that I later had when I first tried LSD. And I also went into like altered states where I saw things that I couldn't have possibly known about as a baby. So it's fascinating to me. So that's what got me interested in psychedelics later to try to recreate that. But I'm wondering, is there a way of recreating that initial thing that I, you know, whatever I had as a baby without the psychedelics, if we have it in our brain, is there a way to activate that in some way without even having to take a substance? Or, or is that just gone forever? Or? I'll, I'll start off with a couple things, but um, yeah, I mean, there, there are some people that talk about endotripping, which is where you have learned how to release whatever it is in your brain that can cause a, a psychedelic-like experience. Um, there's also people that do dark retreats, where you spend almost like a week in complete pitch dark, and your brain starts to create chemicals on its own, and people can have visionary states from that. Um, and basic meditation, you know, a lot of people, and especially uh, having activated your brain in a particular sorts of way with, with psychedelics, when you bring that back to, you know, that kind of like directionality to your meditation uh, from the psychedelic experience, those meditative states can become a lot more rich because you're kind of tapping into that state. And it might be much more of a somatic based experience and maybe not as visual, but um, again, there's a lot more. That's as much as I know about it. Maybe you guys have some other things. I think what uh, Ashley is speaking to and to your question, when we look at broader, I'll kind of zoom out and, and a broader question that a lot of people ask is, what is that relationship then between microdosing and other complementary practices, which is somewhat what, it, what Ashley is talking about with, with the dark room, with um, meditation, with yoga, basically how do we facilitate, in some ways, altered states without, without substances? 
And there's an excellent book, I won't go too deep into it, I'll just recommend a book uh, in, in the interest of time, but there's an excellent book called Stealing Fire by Stephen Kotler. Uh, and he goes deep into how, for example, individuals like the Navy SEALs, uh, um, uh, people in Silicon Valley, so entrepreneurs, extreme sports, um, other individuals who are really performing at a, at a really, really high level, professional athletes, how they're utilizing altered states, and many of them are not drug-induced. And many of them are using other ways to, to facilitate that awakening or, or opening up, of going beyond the ego and kind of seeing things from a different perspective and, and angle. Um, so, Stealing Fire, great book. Maybe something further back. Yes. Back there. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious to hear what you guys think in terms of as things evolve, what the role of traditional therapists, psychotherapists, social workers, what that, how that role is going to evolve with. <laughs> With, um, with the use of psychedelics and how you differentiate when it's actually necessary to have the expertise and when it's not necessary and that people can do it with just you know, a guide or a sitter. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm deeply interested in this question because there are certain things that we really do need a more professional touch with, especially when people have um, more extreme personality disorders, other types of issues that they're dealing with. Um, there's some really interesting research from early on um, with psychedelics where they were treating people with these really extreme disorders with psychedelics and seeing some really interesting results, but it's gonna be a while before we get to start to see those again. But one of the things that I would like to kind of see, you know, as we move into a legalized world is to be able to, you know, how, how can we create spaces where we all know how to hold space? Because right now, uh, and in this transitional phase where we have uh, a predominantly um, psychedelic naive culture, having guides and facilitators, I think is extremely important, you know, as from, from, a, from a guidance perspective, but also from an educational perspective. So moving as we become more literate in the psychedelic world, I see that the people that are uh, looking for a little bit more life optimization rather than maybe really deep healing that could do those kinds of things in a much more um, casual space holding of a community you know and as we can and what I'd like to be able to see is that uh, as moving towards a community model so maybe we have you know these psychedelic community centers in different parts of the city that serve different communities and so you know, and maybe you've got the, your psychiatrists and therapists and people that are also part of that for people that need uh, deeper healing work, but maybe there's group work together where people can just come and share their own experiences. And, uh, you know, I was, I was just speaking with, with someone recently who went through an MDMA assisted psychotherapy experience um, in the underground, and they were looking more from a uh, life optimization perspective and they didn't really see anything that was like too over like over the top y that but I was thinking I wonder if having more of uh, like MDMA in a group setting where you can have these social interactions and kind of heal your social wounding through a social uh, 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 a welcoming and good health well held space in that kind of model so I think as a culture, we need to learn how to hold space uh, before, but in the meantime, we need these guides and these therapists to be able to teach us how to do that. And just as a question of clarification, when you, when just to, for my purpose, and I think maybe some of the other audience, when you say holding space, what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, I guess the way I would define holding space is being able to be present with someone through whatever it is that they're experiencing while holding a, a loving, neutral container. So you're not presenting or, or putting your uh, personality all over their experience or trying to comfort them or save them from their discomfort. It's being able to be with someone 
while they're in a space of discomfort um, and allowing them to feel like they're not alone, that they're safe. Uh, you know, it, it's like being able to hold someone's hand without having to like pet it or tap it. It's like you can just hold it there and just let them know that you're where with them without having to try and comfort them. It's, it's, it's not that complicated, but it, I think it's, it's a type of meditation that, that's just a lot of loving presence and being a good listener. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to know what we know about um, SSRIs and psychedelics. Do they go together? Do they inhibit? How does that work? Um, so, I will refer you to Jim Fadiman's website, who is the godfather of microdosing, microdosingpsychedelics.com. Um, on that website, he has a list of substances, pharmaceuticals, that people have used while microdosing, and there's shown to be no contraindication with that process. Um, beyond that, I can tell you that there are people who are microdosing while on SSRIs, um, that they sh people who are interested in this really should check with a doctor or psychiatrist beforehand, and there are more and more psychiatrists, particularly in the LA area, who are starting to learn about microdosing. Um, so I think having that medical advice is really critical. Um, that's about all I feel comfortable saying on the topic. Anything that you want to say? Any, are there any medical doctors or psychiatrists here tonight or people who have some sort of background knowledge who can better go into that? Yes? No? Yeah, so um, that's probably the, the best that, that we can say, um, if you want to. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not giving advice explicitly here, but there are things that you have to consider, and that's why, why it is difficult to give one broad brushstroke uh, answer. And, and some of that comes down to genetic predispositions, which thankfully now we can take a look at. Like there are some genes, that, for example, that encode for warrior versus warrior, and they're really highly common in both combat sports athletes as well as people who suffer from anxiety and users of SSRIs. And so unpacking that as well as some medical testing will give you a pretty good, as, along with a good therapist and doctor again, will we'll give you a, a pretty good idea of where your neurotransmitter levels are at right now. And the reality is that things like anti-anxieties and antidepressants have been shown to reprogram your, your permanent, your baseline level of neurotransmitters. And so it's difficult to say what your experience is gonna be like with a certain psychedelic beyond knowing that. For example, if you have uh, a big time excess of, of dopamine or acetylcholine or some of these more energetic, high strung type um, uh, neurotransmitters, you're probably gonna have certain almost like anxiety-like effects from certain psychedelics, whereas others might highly relax you because they're recalibrating a balance of maybe some of the more relaxatory ones like uh, serotonin and GABA. So I know that wasn't a, that was kind of a politician's answer, but I just wanted to give you some, a tree, trees to bark up, I hope, you know. Um, to add to that, there's, um, there's a very interesting article that came out that made the difference between uh, passive coping and active coping where passive coping kind of numbs down the triggers of your emotional system and active coping helps you to actually cope with them, actually change your brain so you can actively more cope with that. So if you Google that, that might be an interesting framework to deal with like how psychedelics can help you with the things you're dealing with. Um, active versus passive coping and psychedelics. And to clarify, the <coughs> what Martine is saying is SSRIs are often tied to passive coping um, in that they blunt the initial emotional response but don't allow you to actually deal with the stuff that's underneath it. So they're effective in the short term, it looks like, whereas psychedelics are active coping because they activate the 5-HT2A receptor. A lot of these SSRIs activate the 5-HT1A, which is tied to passive. 5-HT2A is tied to active coping, which basically is why it's effective at helping to deal with emotional trauma um, when used within a container. So we have, we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. Yep, yep. A 
I'm really glad you differentiated between cure and a state of um, no longer being diagnosable. So I'm wondering, for this phase three study that you have, is it, um, is it a dose escalation? Is it an observational? And are you taking a, long, uh, taking a look at long-term adverse events? How is that working? Yeah, so it's a, a double-blind placebo-controlled uh, clinical trial. Uh, we are tracking for adverse events during the whole thing. The, the three uh, experiences that they have with the medicine, they have uh, two preparatory, or three preparatory sessions and a medicine session and then a month, then two more prep, or two, three more prep sessions and another a month later so that the experimental sessions are one month apart. And then we have a one month follow-up and then I think some of the phase two trials had had follow-ups that were two to three years later. So um, did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. So we will wrap up now because it's approaching 9.30. We want to give everyone a chance to mingle a little bit afterwards and, and talk. So if we could just give one more round of applause to our wonderful <laughs> panelists. And then before I go off the mic, I think Ashley wants to say one more thing. But before I go off the mic, I just want to thank all of you for being here, for showing up for remaining attentive and engaged, uh, for your questions, uh, for your presence. Uh, as I emphasized at the beginning, I think being able to come together in a space like this and talk about uh, you know, those funny experiences we had or may have, um, whether in microdoses or higher doses, uh, acts as a vehicle for kind of cultural evolution. And so Based on the topic that was tonight, which was microdosing, I want to point you to some further resources that you can engage with after this process. Uh, one of which is we have an online microdosing course, which is basically walks you through the microdosing process. And so if you're interested in that, the course and community, then we also have a 50% off uh, coupon which is a WARE project if you want access to that. And because we are a nonprofit, all of this goes to supporting uh, the team that we have. We have about 16 members who are working on the third wave, uh, trying to basically amplify psychedelic literacy through the elements that I mentioned before. In addition to that, um, if you want to further discuss our, our mission, our vision, uh, we are currently uh, fundraising uh, to basically give ourselves a vehicle for the next six months to run with. And so if there are any of you interested in, in engaging in that conversation with me, it would be great to either connect after this event or please send me an email, uh, paul at the third wave .co. Um, And that's about it. So that's all I have. So again, thank you so much for your attention and all your energy. So you guys can mingle and make friends and thank you so much for all y'all for coming.